Madame, Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Je suis un modérateur francophone. Je vous laisse un peu de temps pour euh, utiliser vos casques. Je m'appelle El Hadib Nadir, je suis du Maroc et je co-préside le GFMD et c'est à ce titre que euh, j'ai été invité pour euh, modérer cette session. Tout d'abord, je voudrais remercier euh, l'OIM de cette invitation et les féliciter du choix de cette, euh, de cette thématique qui est d'actualité aujourd'hui. Euh, maintenant que nous sommes à quelques semaines de l'adoption euh, du pacte mondial à Marrakech. Je souhaite la bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Je sais que les sessions du début de l'après-midi sont les plus difficiles à démarrer, bien que les repas n'étaient pas très copieux. Pour certains, il n'y avait pas de repas du tout parce qu'il y avait un side event entre 13h et 15h. En tout cas, merci, merci d'être là et euh, nous souhaitons avoir une discussion fructueuse avec nos panélistes ici présents. Le processus d'élaboration du pacte mondial était un processus dynamique qui, dans sa phase de consultation, avait mobilisé beaucoup de monde et beaucoup de parties prenantes, euh, puisqu'il s'agit d'une question multidimensionnelle et complexe. Et à partir de là, euh, la mise en œuvre de ce pacte mondial nécessite la mobilisation et l'accompagnement de toutes ces parties prenantes pour d'abord s'approprier cet instrument avant de l'implémenter et le mettre en place. D'où les besoins en matière de développement des capacités de toutes ces parties prenantes qui ont été mobilisées lors des consultations euh, nationales. Il va falloir tout d'abord revenir vers ces parties prenantes, leur présenter le fruit euh, euh, de, 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 qui, a été, donc, qui a été retenu à la fin de ce processus de de négociation et pour voir euh, euh, et discuter ensemble comment l'implémenter et le mettre en place. Migration, question complexe et multidimensionnelle, nécessite responsabilité partagée, nécessite là également des partenariats à plusieurs niveaux et c'est le sujet que nous allons euh, en partie discuter euh, cet après-midi. Je voudrais partager avec vous en tant que euh, président du GFMD euh, et marocains, représentants du Maroc, deux éléments. D'abord, premier élément qui concerne le GFMD. Comme vous le savez, nous avons mis en place une base de données, une plateforme des partenariats qui regroupe aujourd'hui plus de 1000 exemples et initiatives concrètes qui, à mon avis, pourraient inspirer toutes les parties prenantes qui sont impliquées dans la question migratoire qui soit représentants de gouvernements, de sociétés civiles, secteurs privés et autres. Deuxième élément que je voudrais partager avec vous, qui a une relation directe avec le sujet d'aujourd'hui, qui est l'implication des organisations qui font partie des Nations Unies. C'est un exemple marocain. Comme vous le savez, le Maroc s'est transformé en un pays d'accueil des migrants il y a quelques années, exactement il y a cinq ans, nous avons travaillé sur la mise en place d'une politique migratoire pour euh, une meilleure gouvernance de, cette, de, ce, de, ce phénomène, de ce phénomène migratoire. Et nous avons réuni à cette occasion toutes les agences onusiennes qui sont présentes au Maroc pour discuter la question Comment, euh, en tant qu'agence onusienne, accompagner le Maroc sur cette question aussi complexe, multidimensionnelle, pour un pays qui, pour la première fois, est affronté à la question d'accueil des, des, des migrants Et nous avons monté un programme que nous avons intitulé un programme conjoint 
d'appui à la stratégie nationale d'immigration et d'asile, tout en respectant un certain nombre de principes, parce que réunir toutes les agences des Nations Unies autour de la même question, vous conviendrez avec moi que c'est une tâche un peu, un peu difficile et je souhaite beaucoup de courage à l'OIM qui va coordonner les agences onusiennes pour travailler sur la question de la migration. Nous avons, dès le départ, posé un certain nombre de principes qui sont la recherche de la synergie et de la complémentarité, et c'est un mot-clé qui est dans l'introduction de cette, de cette session, l'optimisation des ressources et surtout le respect des missions et des mandats de chacun. Il ne s'agissait pas de euh, faire travailler euh, ces, ces agences ensemble sur des territoires où il y a un chevauchement des, des missions et des responsabilités. Et nous avons donc monté un programme conjoint euh, qui, aujourd'hui, se déroule avec des projets concrets euh, de, de renforcement des capacités nationales, mais aussi des projets euh, directs euh, d'éducation des enfants, de protection des droits, etc. C'est un groupe qui est euh, coordonné par l'OIM, l'OIM local, et le plus de euh, représentants résident du PNUD au Maroc. Voilà un exemple qui, avec beaucoup de difficultés de démarrage, aujourd'hui marche bien parce que nous avons besoin de cette intelligence collective si on veut s'attaquer à des questions aussi complexes que, que la migration. Alors, pour discuter la question qui, de, de, cette, de cet atelier que je dois rappeler, donc qui est sur la coordination de l'appui des Nations Unies au développement des capacités en matière de migration. Nous avons euh, quatre panélistes de, de, de qualité, mais euh, auxquels je voudrais rappeler les questions qui m'ont été euh, euh, signifiées par les organisateurs et que je dois rappeler aux, aux différents panélistes. Ils sont au nombre de trois, elles sont au nombre de trois. D'abord, comment nouer ou renforcer des partenariats permettant de garantir une élaboration et une mise en, en œuvre cohérente des mesures de développement des capacités dans le domaine de la migration Deuxième question, quels sont les outils en place pour évaluer au mieux les besoins en matière de développement des capacités dans le domaine de la migration Et la dernière question, comment le réseau des Nations Unies sur les migrations peut-il renforcer les synergies et la coordination au sein du système Alors, pour euh, débattre de cette question, nous avons les quatre panélistes euh, qui sont euh, M. Lobert, à ma droite, représentant permanent de la Suisse auprès des Nations Unies à New York, qu'on ne présente plus parce qu'ils avaient la lourde tâche avec son collègue qui vient d'arriver, l'ambassadeur Gomez Camacho, d'être les cofacilitateurs de l'élaboration de ce pacte mondial tant attendu. Et je voudrais les féliciter pour le travail accompli et pour tous les efforts déployés tout au long de ce processus. Et pour vous réveiller, je vais vous demander de les applaudir, s'il vous plaît, <rire> très chaleureusement, parce qu'ils le méritent. Alors, sans plus tarder, donc, je vais vous donner la parole, euh, euh, ambassadeur. Euh, euh, on avait dit que leur rôle euh, est... Euh, c'était terminé quand, le 12 ou le 11 juillet à New York quand le, le document a été euh, approuvé, mais je crois que votre rôle n'est pas, pas encore terminé. Vous avez du travail à faire pour faire connaître ce bébé et le, faire, et le transmettre aux États euh, pour le, le, le faire grandir. À vous la parole, M. Ambassadeur. Merci. Thank you very much, Habib. Thank you. Um, and, um It was a Friday the 13th, actually, when we concluded in New York. Maybe that's why it's like a, not a curse, but it, maybe it's that's how, how it stays with us. Um, thank you very much to IOM for, for having uh, the both uh, of us uh, here. It, for me, personally, it's uh, really very nice to be back in Geneva, of course. 
uh, being Swiss, but also because I feel that the, you, I, I feel the uh, the issue comes back home. Uh, you remember early on in the process we had these uh, discussions between Geneva and New York. Where does it belong? I, I think it belongs to both. But now that uh, the compact uh, has been negotiated, I think it really needs to come back to Geneva. Uh, looking into all aspects of, uh, of implementation. Um, before I try to answer your questions, I want to pick up on something that was discussed this morning, because um, if you know us, uh, Ambassador Gomez Camacho and I, you, you will not be surprised that I say similar things uh, that he said this morning, but it really, it's very close to my heart, um, what I want to underline again. We had uh, a week ago in New York the, the famous or notorious opening of the new General Assembly session of the 73rd session, the high-level week, where we had a whole series of statements from heads of states and, and, and governments. And if there was one theme in the statements, then it was the multilateral system uh, being challenged or under pressure. And in this discussion, um, there were a couple of examples uh, of positive stories where the system still works and makes progress. And one was the Global Compact on Migration. And I think we can all take, um, all of us here and all of the many, many colleagues out there who participated in this process, we can indeed be um, proud that in this challenging times on an issue that is so sensitive that we were able to come to a conclusion on a document that I think uh, I'm not the only one who believes that it's a really solid uh, document. Now why, why did we succeed? Uh, we mentioned it a bit this morning. We believe, or I believe, uh, it succeeded because we had enough time to devote really to the issue. We had enough time to first really drill down on the issues, on the questions, and to make this discussion facts and, and evidence-based. You've heard us for 12 months at least just talking about this, and we were sitting together, we were meeting in different places, uh, here in Vienna, in, in, in regional centers, really going down, and what, what is this all about? What are the facts? What are the figures? What, what's beyond the, uh, the, the perceptions and, and, and the stories? And that, I think, was, was a very important element. The other element was the, the comprehensive approach, the 360-degree <coughs> approach, the, 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 the willingness of everybody in the room to listen to each other, to listen to others' points of views, to listen to um, national specificities and national concerns and come together and construct a document that takes all of this into account and does justice uh, to everybody who was participating in the process. Based on general principles, we know, we all know where in general we want to go, what's in general needed to make migration safe, orderly and regular, but we also recognize that a level down on national, regional, and especially national level, the, the situations are very different, very specific, the capacities are different, and the, the needs are different. And I think we recognize that, and we came out with a document uh, that recognized that. It's also, by the way, one of the reasons why we have a non-legally binding document. But maybe we get back to that uh, uh, when we respond to questions. Now, these factors that made the negotiation successful and brought uh, about this, this document, this result. And that's the point I want to underline again. This, that must continue now when we approach implementation. We need to make sure that we remain inclusive and comprehensive when we go about implementing these, uh, this document. And to do so on, a, on an international, on a global, but especially uh, on a national uh, level as well. Um, my Mexican colleague, colleague talks a, a lot about the, the fact that we live in an age of mistrust, and I very much second that. We all know it from our respective countries, governments. There is a lot of 
disconnect these days between governments and, and the people. We see it on a national level, we see it on an international level. There's also a lot of withdrawal. You know, we all have a tendency to withdraw into our bubbles. You know, this here is the bubble of people who understand migration. And there is another bubble of people who don't want migration because they don't want it. And we have a tendency not to talk to each other. And that's a recipe for disaster. If we are not able to discuss with each other and try to understand each other and try to see where the others come from, we will not be able to implement this, which is, I like to think, a really great document. So that's what we need. Now what we go about the implementation, we go down to the national level. And the, the document is actually also, for that reason, a very good document. It, it allows precisely for that. It, it puts down or, or, or reconfirms some of the big principles, but then it goes down and offers a menu of very specific measures that the member states implement according to their specific needs and capacities and situations. And that's uh, so a plea to everybody, to all of us, that we don't forget what made the negotiations for the document successful and continue this now that we're going down uh, on a national level uh, for implementation. Now, I also like to think that that's how we should go about um, when we talk about the, um, the capacity building mechanism and the response of the UN system. I would very much plead for a bottom-up approach. The capacity building mechanism you see in the document uh, is precisely not a new complicated bureaucracy or mechanism that takes a top-down approach, first going into a multi-year phase of finding out who has what capacities and, and what are the best the new mechanisms, but it's supposed to be something very practical. There is, as we found out also during this, late, this, this uh, 18 months of negotiations and consultations, there is an enormous amount of expertise and, 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 and knowledge and, and, and practical uh, solutions out there already. Uh, regional, national bodies, civil society, academia, there's a lot out there. The, the mechanism is there to bring all of this together, not to create new ones, not to make it more complicated, but to bring it together. And uh, it, of course, IOM will have a very important responsibility and role to play, but it's the responsibility of all of us, of all us who are a part of this very multifaceted, very, uh, very uh, varied system to play the part. So to, to feed in our requests, but also to feed in our solutions and let us be connected uh, by this new system. That's, that's my plea with regard to the, to the capacity building mechanism. Now the UN system, I, from, from what I've heard, from what we've heard during um, our process, I feel that member states would like the UN system to respond in a way that is, again, uh, producing results, something that is very solution-oriented and demand-driven, not um, what we sometimes have uh, from the system. Uh, that they just bring what they have. You know, they, uh, no, we need we need solutions from without from outside from within the system that respond to the very again the very specific needs and capacities of the individual member states. Um, so that would mean for, and I see this on two levels. For the UN migration network, it would mean that they really find a way for the agencies to work together. On the one hand bringing down the silos, so allowing a, 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 a transversal, uh, across silos approach. Across silos doesn't mean everybody does everything. Uh, the chair just said it. It's a reconfirmation of each agency's specific expertise and mandate, but it means that they are able to work together because very often you can't limit um, the issue to health or youth or human rights or whatever, it has, it has to come together. So the UN system in the migration network has to find a way for these agencies to work together. 
not duplicating each other, but working together and finding customized packages of expertise and solutions that really respond to the need of member states. The same has to happen on, on national level. And there, I think, we are fortunate to see what's happening right now in, 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 the, in the reform of the UN development system that uh, tries to or will or is introducing the new resident coordinator system where it's, it's about the same thing but on a national level. Uh, we want the UN on a national level to work better together and to be again more focused on not what the UN has to offer but what the specific member states uh, need and this in terms of migration should also have an impact. So the, the, the migration uh, network would do that I think on a, on, a, on a higher level and the UN development system, the new resident coordinator system, the way they put together the country teams would do that on a very practical national level. So that, that's I, what I believe are, are the requests or what, what member states would like to see the UN system to do, not exclusively but including uh, the migration the migration issue. And again, um, please, all of us, let's take the same approach to the implementation that we took in the, the development, in the, in the negotiations towards, uh, towards this instrument, which is the, the Global Compact on Migration. Thank you, Mark. Merci, uh, merci, Ambassador. Maintenant, je donnerai la parole à Madame Soumia Swaminathan, qui représente l'Organisation mondiale de la santé et qui est directrice générale adjointe chargée des programmes. À vous la parole, Madame. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm uh, delighted to be here on on behalf of uh, World Health Organization. And I also have my colleague, uh, Dr. Ranieri Guerra here, uh, and he's in charge of the newly formed unit on migrants and refugees health. And, and therefore, we'll be able to answer any questions uh, that you all may have. So I'll keep my remarks fairly brief to begin with so that perhaps we have a little time for discussion. As you know, uh, the WHO is really responsible uh, for to be the directing and coordinating body for health globally and within the UN system. And I'm delighted that uh, Ambassador Logger you mentioned the new uh, system, the uh, RC system at the country level, which is, I think, going to really work in the right direction of bringing the UN agencies together and therefore is very much in line with the theme of this discussion that we're having this afternoon around partnerships and how to deliver uh, as as a network of UN agencies to improve the health and life of migrants and, and refugees. Now, when you look at the global compact that we fully embrace, uh, we see that health is mentioned at least two dozen times within the document. So it's clear that health has been recognized as a very important part of the overall uh, life cycle of, of migrants both starting from the place of origin, where they may al already be in disadvantaged situations. They may be migrating because of conflict, it could be because of extreme weather events, it could be because of a number of circumstances that have already made them a vulnerable, uh, in a, put them in a vulnerable situation. And then, of course, they move through difficult uh, travel sometimes, and then through transiting countries, and then to the final destination country. So this whole journey uh, can be quite traumatic and can add to the health burdens that they already have, particularly for the vulnerable among them, the young children, the pregnant women, and the elderly. It also brings up the, the important point that it requires cooperation and collaboration across borders to really be able to address this. So we need the global compact and the global understanding. We need regional level frameworks, and then we need cross-border collaboration if we really are to do uh, justice to this. So we really welcome the establishment of the network which will guide the implementation of the compact, and, and we're going to be actively uh, involved with that. 
Now, in terms of what are the needs and what are the tools that we can offer, I think one of the first and most important ones is data. And I was looking up the website to see uh, the IOM has a very good visualization tool. But when you look under health, you find very few details. And this is because many countries, when they're collecting health data, do not necessarily uh, note down the status, the migration status of a particular individual. So whether it's a health survey, whether it's hospital data, or whether it's uh, data collected for other purposes, unless you start documenting the status of the individual, whether they're a migrant, and if so, whether a recent migrant and so on, it's very hard to really disaggregate uh, from the available health data to find out what the health status is. So I think that's the first thing that member states and others should really discuss as to how are we going to collect better data on migrants, and particularly to do with health. I think this is going to be extremely important. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to monitor. And this, again, brings us to the question of indicators. Uh, if we are going to develop a system of indicators, then I think these health data are going to be extremely important. The second one is how to assess the system capacities to deal with migrants. We do have uh, instances where a huge number of migrants suddenly pour into a country overwhelming their own capacities and overwhelming their health system. So the WHO European office, in collaboration with IOM and UNHCR, has developed a toolkit that member states can use, ministries of health can use, to assess the system cap capacities and the readiness and be able to take corrective action uh, and put in place uh, the steps that are needed to really address that. And this toolkit could be adapted, and uh, we would also work on it further and make it more user-friendly and available and applicable to other regions uh, as well. I think a third one is, is best practices. And this would be very useful, again, because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. If something has worked well in one setting, other countries could certainly use it and adapt it. Uh, and a, and a recent example was given at the summer school in mig of migration, migrant health that's held every year. I think this is the second or third one, right? Really. And, and there was an example given uh, from two Syrian refugees, a doctor and a nurse, who were in a refugee camp in Turkey and uh, were really feeling completely uh, hopeless about their lives. But then with the support of WHO and working with other UN agencies, there was uh, training done, and, and it was made possible for these people to actually start working, even within those refugee settings, but using their skills as doctors and nurses. And, and that really empowered them and made them feel that uh, they had some kind of a semblance of a life, uh, and, and of course, waiting for the time that they could, they could go back. So we have another program where we're trying to work with the Global Fund to implement uh, uh, TB and HIV screening in uh, detention centers in Libya to because very often uh, the migrants and refugees are in poor health because of all the reasons I, I gave before and they're extremely vulnerable to communicable diseases like tuberculosis and also of course cholera and other waterborne diseases as well as pneumonia and respiratory infections. At the same time we must remember that globally today non-communicable diseases are the leading uh, burden disease burden, the leading cause of death, diseases like hypertension and diabetes, for which you need lifelong treatment. And if you've moved away from your place of residence, you're not going to have access to those uh, medicines. And this may put people in very dangerous situations of having heart attacks, having strokes, or going into kidney <coughs> failure. So it's important, really, to think both about infectious diseases, which we are generally trained to do, but also non-communicable diseases to ensure that people who need chronic treatment, long duration treatment, uh, have access to that. I also very much appreciate the comments made by Ambassador Lauber about the bottom-up approach to capacity development. And that's exactly the approach that WHO is taking in our own transformation process that we're undergoing now as we're developing our five-year strategic plan of work it's our country offices that are going to develop country support plans. They identify the priorities in consultation with the ministries of health 
and identify the areas where support is needed, either from our regional offices or from the headquarters or from a network of global experts that, that we could draw upon. So I think learning from each other, not reinventing or duplicating, ensuring better data, collaborating across uh, borders uh, particularly, and um, I think some of those would be the basic uh, messages that I would like to give at this stage, but happy to answer more questions later. Merci, docteur, pour ces messages euh, clairs. Et je crois qu'aujourd'hui, nous avons besoin d'être ensemble mobilisés si on veut traduire cet instrument en action concrète. Si vous permettez, je vais passer, repasser à droite. Si quelqu'un a compris pourquoi il y a les panélistes hommes à droite et les panélistes femmes à gauche, je suis preneur de cette explication. Alors, M. Sikander Khan, qui euh, représente l'UNICEF et qui est directeur du Bureau des programmes d'urgence ici à Genève. À vous la parole, monsieur. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nadir. Uh, Excellencies, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me also join the moderator in, in thanking the two uh, co-facilitators. Um, undoubtedly, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a truly a breakthrough um, in its commitments for the, the for children, uh, the compact itself. Um, among other provisions of the GCM, uh, it also commits to include migrant children in a national child protection systems. Uh, it also ensures a safe access to basic services regardless of migration status, and upholds. Uh, the principle of the best interest of the child at all times in all situations and this is big this is major we have demonstrated and thanks to the the, the very efficient co-facilitation um, the the capacity to negotiate successfully i think now we need to examine our capacity to implement as well uh, who do we rely on to implement the gcm whose capacity do we need to build and how do we actually move forward? To answer this question, um, I would like to introduce just one real character, um, Eric. Eric had, and his family had left Honduras by bus nine years ago to escape poverty. After transiting through Guatemala, they were stopped at a police roadblock in Mexico, where a policeman took Eric, a nine-year-old boy, off the bus at gunpoint and threatened to separate him from his mother. Then, after spending four months in jail, this is a nine-year-old boy, four months in jail, Eric and his family were deported back to Honduras. Today, nine years later, Eric acknowledges that he still has psychological problems from that experience. Anyone would, our children would as well. It is for children like Eric that capacity building on migration issues is vital as far as we are concerned as UNICEF. Was information available to Eric's family on the risks of migration? Were there codes of conduct in place for the police? Were there alternatives to detention available at the time? Were, were consular officials trained to detect their protection needs? Was there a reception center in Honduras to help Eric and his family reintegrate? The example of Eric confirms the critical importance of capacity building in both child protection and migration management systems. What do we mean by child protection? Child protection systems can be distilled into four Ps for simplicity, and let's remember those the policies, the procedures, the people, the places that need to be in place and working hand in hand with migrat migration management systems to protect child migrants. The UN, the UN should only be providers of last resort and when there is no child protection system in place. The success of UN capacity building should rather be measured by strengthening of local, national, and regional protection systems. 
I would like to share four critical capacity needs that the UN could play a role in addressing. The first is the need for child protection and migration management systems to work together. Second is the need to strengthen the policies, procedures, people and places that comprise these systems. Third is the need for cross-border cooperation. And fourth is the need for data. First, child protection systems need to work hand in hand with migration management systems. The GCM commits states to ensuring child protection authorities are promptly informed and assigned to participate in procedures for the determination of the best interest of the child once an unaccompanied or separated child crosses an international border, including by training border officials in the right of the child and child-sensitive procedures. There are good examples globally of these two systems working together to prevent children from falling through the cracks. Zambia, for instance, ad adopted guidelines and na a national referral mechanism to enable police and migration authorities to identify and refer vulnerable migrant children to appro appropriate protective services. Second is the need to strengthen policies and procedures and the capacities of people in places where they are in contact with migrant children. Here, I would like to cite examples of how child sensitivity has been integrated into the core capacity building of those working with migrant children. Frontex, the, the European border and Coast Guard Agency has developed a child protection strategy, code of conduct and trainings, including trainings for border guards and airport staff to spot children who may be victims of trafficking. In Serbia and Slovenia, UNICEF worked with na uh, national authorities and partners to set up tools and mechanisms to ensure the best interest of migrant children are respected and protected. In Honduras, UNICEF, IOM, and the National Red Cross provided trainings and kits to Ministry of Health, social workers, and psycho psychologists to ex expand access to psychosocial support for returned child migrants. Thirdly, the nature of migration means that cooperation needs to happen not just at national and local levels, but across countries. Here, the GCM commits states to enhancing international, regional, and cross-regional border management cooperation. This is another area where the UN network on migration can clearly add value. For example, as UNICEF, we are supporting the economic community of West African states in the adoption and now the implementation of region-wide procedures to identify, refer, assist, return, reintegrate vulnerable children on the move. There are other regional bodies and mechanisms like the AU, the Bali process, and can also play a critical role in protecting children cross borders. Fourth, data. Almost one out of four countries do not have age desegregated data on migrants. We know that what we do not count often does not count. Here, again, the GCM includes an important com commitment for states to develop a global program to build and enhance national capacities in data collection, analysis, and dissemination. There are examples of partnerships that we could learn from. For example, in 2017, UNICEF and IOM jointly launched a displacement tracking matrix for children on the move project to improve the evidence base of needs and risk faced by children in situation of forced displacements or migration, and to facilitate timely and informed child protection and education interventions. At the regional level in Europe, UNICEF, IOM, UNHCR joined forces to fill in the critical data gap on children on the move through joint data analysis and publications, coordinated research initiatives, and joint advocacy on improving national and European administrative, administrative data systems. In Greece, the three agencies also supported the National Solidarity Center for Social Services and Hellenic Statistical Authority in strengthening capacity to track uh, place unaccompanied children. Finally, let me highlight one more important aspect. Those who know best for what is working and what is not are migrants themselves. It is our best, uh, our, 
it is our own best interest to also build capacity of young migrants themselves to co-create solutions and provide evidence and feedback on the impact of immigration practices. Anas Ansar, a young migrant who addressed the policymakers in June, put it in this way. One way of making migration safer and better for young people is to have us be part of the discussion. There's need to be, uh, there's need to be space offered which allows young people to meaningfully contribute throughout the process of setting strategies, planning, and implementing accordingly. To conclude, as we think about capacity building, let us, let us be bold and also take lesson uh, from the, the negotiation process and have a 360 degree view whose capacity needs to be built to make migration safe, orderly, and regular for all, including children. As concerns UNICEF, we are fully committed to playing an active part in the new migration network and capacity building mechanism. We owe it to Eric and the 50 million children who have migrated across borders or been forcibly displaced to get this right. Thank you. Merci, uh, Monsieur, for your contribution and for your predisposition to contribute to the réussite of this mécanisme de développement des, des capacités. Donc, je me retourne encore une fois à gauche. Madame Roula Hamati, qui est représentante du groupe de travail chargé de la mise en œuvre des pactes mondial sur les migrations et coordinatrice des centres interrégionaux pour les réfugiés et les migrants. Nous vous écoutons avec beaucoup d'intérêt. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you for this... Um invitation to be at the IDM, a very timely moment. Um, my intervention will focus on the civil society working group on the engagement with the IOM on implementation, follow-up, and review. Um, it's a long name, but it's a fairly uh, simple concept for the working group. Uh, what I will try to get at during my presentation is to uh, talk a little bit about how this working group uh, came to be about, who are the members of this working group, the functions of this working group, and finally, to, to talk a little bit about the added value of having a working group like that. Um, let me start by saying that both the New York Declaration and the Global Compact on Migration gave a big role to civil society organizations. And I think this uh, we've just heard from Ambassador Lauber about the importance of being inclusive in implementation as well. Um, so there is a clear recognition of the role of civil society in the compact development, but also implementation follow-up and review. Uh, the group came about, I think we can trace it back uh, in the beginning, to the seven regional consultations that took place last year as we were in the process uh, of preparing the, uh, the Global Compact on Migration uh, process. There were regional civil society consultations happening already in parallel to the official ones. Um, I think a direct outcome of, outcome of these consultations were the mobilization of a large number of civil society organizations, not only those traditionally present in Geneva and New York, mm -hmm. but also civil society who are present in all parts of the world and who work on migration on the ground and who have a big interest in this um, process. So this is more of the direct outcome of the consultations, but more indirectly, um, I think the, uh, the process has contributed really to strengthening and uh, really enriching the kind of relationship that civil society already has uh, with the different UN agencies and with IOM as well. Um, so, so this working group actually originated from the need that civil society has felt within its consultative processes to have a moment uh, to have uh, exchange with IOM uh, to talk about the role of civil society engagement um, in the implementation follow-up and review of the working group. And that, that actually the idea for this uh, working group came out during a meeting that civil society had with IOM and during where, where civil society had actually proposed to form an informal group, and this is still an informal group, to have these kinds of reflections and discussions early on in the, uh, in the development of the global compact process, particularly during the negotiation phase. So regarding the second question, so who are the members of this working group? Uh, the working group has gradually expanded. I think we are still in the phase of learning and development, and we're still uh, developing this working group. Uh, but the working group actually uh, includes 20 representatives of civil society and also representatives from IOM. Uh, the civil society component of this working group is, is really comprised of different sectors uh, within civil society. 
It is comprised of global networks. It also includes uh, regional representatives. It includes uh, la the labor movement. It includes women group, children group, youth. Um, so it's really, really trying to capture all of the different diversity within civil society. Having said that, uh, we are very aware as a group that there is no such thing as perfect representation, uh, that civil society is very diverse and a very large movement, and we really try to learn um, in, in ways to keep this conversation open, to keep this conversation flowing between civil society and IOM, and really not to restrict this to a group of people who will lead this um, conversation uh, of IOM. So we are very aware of, of the question of representation, we're very aware of the need to have a very uh, inclusive conversation and not to have a few people from civil society discussing um, this uh, or controlling this conversation. Um, and in order to do that, I think there were a few measures that were adopted by the group early on as a result of an internal reflection. The first one was to have it as an informal, which is still the case. The second measure is to have it time bound, ending in December. And the third message is to keep the information flowing um, in both directions, to keep an informal, uh, very free flow of information between civil society as such and between the working group members and uh, with IOM. Um, regarding the functions of the working group, uh, being still a new working group, it took us some time to really um, look at the issues that we want to discuss. Uh, this is a new model in a way, and this is still being defined. Uh, there are a lot of issues that are of interest, but how can we use this moment to really look at implementation, follow-up, and, and review was uh, the basic uh, issue that we were facing as a working group. Um, I think there are three main functions that we talk about when we talk about this group. The first one is a space for information exchange and regular updates, so uh, the members will meet, and also with IOM, and there's a, an exchange of information and updates regarding the, uh, the uh, global compact process, the migration network, and all of the things that are uncovering uh, just now. It is also a space where specific proposals are being presented on the role of civil society, on the role, on the participation of civil society in the process, but also on the larger uh, thinking from civil society on how do we see implementation follow-up and review happening. And it's also a space that's been gradually happening for, um, for larger discussions on how do we see the UN system fit for purpose, how do we see the role of the different agencies within the UN system. We can have a free conversation about that. Uh, so the final question of what is the added value um, of this working group, I think uh, the added value is that it comes at a, at a moment where there's a lot of so collective thinking from civil society about what kind of vision, and there's a lot of energy going on leading up to the adoption of the compact in Marrakesh. So this is a very timely moment for us to be having this interface to meet and to also discuss ideas. Um, I think this is also an integral part of the discussions that we need to be having, not only with IOM, but also with the, the other UN agencies. So this is not to say that this is where civil society needs to be discussing. It's also a, a space where civil society needs to be discussing and is actually discussing with the other UN agencies. Um, and it's part of having a more inclusive, more comprehensive process. Um, and I think a crucial point that civil society has been making throughout uh, this process is that we need to have through civil society participation and implementation follow-up and review, that needs to happen at all levels, and we've heard that this now just now from Ambassador Lauber. And I think the same stands with regards to the kind of conversations that need to be happening with the UN agencies. These two need to happen at the different levels, not just at the global head of agency level, but also at the regional and national level. And I think this is something that we realize and we're aware of and we're starting to develop. Um, as MENA region, we are starting to have this conversation with the UN agencies at the regional and national level. I know the HR region through Migrant Forum Asia are also having these conversations at regional and national level. And finally, um, to conclude, I think there's a lot of practices also happening at the regional level from the economic commissions in different parts of the world. So for instance, in the Arab region, in uh, Asia, but also in Africa, there are a lot of uh, good practices happening and it's also a question of how can we build on these good practices so that knowing that we start from different starting points, how do we start from these points and also get to where uh, we want to get and how do we build partnerships between civil society um, and these uh, regional uh, regional compositions. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour votre contribution et cette perspective de la de la société civile intéressante. Merci à vous tous. Euh,